Welcome everybody to our brand new show for the Rejoining You Party. And we're privileged today to be with Richard Hewison. Would you like to introduce yourself, please, Richard? Uh, definitely a privilege, of course, Alex. Uh, so thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. My name is Richard Hewison. I am currently the leader and the treasurer of the Rejoining You Party based in London. And Brendan, would you introduce yourself, please? I'm a deputy leader of the Rejoining You Party. I'm a former Conservative member of the European Parliament. And now I run a, a think tank. And Adrian? Yes, I'm the uh, Rejoin EU Party Iberia uh, coordinator. So, Brexit. <laughs> this week, we've got so much to talk about. <laughs> so, I, it's actually like, it's very strange. Some weeks it's so quiet and other weeks it just explodes and there's just too much going on. It's not, it's like a, like a roller coaster. Richard, Swell of Raverman, how, how's everything going with her? Well, she's had a great week, hasn't she, really? Uh, I mean, I think it, one of the interesting things, I think, in politics is obviously the actual driving offence itself and what happened. Probably it would be small beer, usually. But I think it indicates the amount of hatred and vitriol within the Conservative Party that we've seen. So, and let's be honest, so many non-Suella fans have been briefing against her this week and making this into a much bigger issue. The thing that I find quite sad is it is overshadowing some of the real damage that she's been doing as Home Secretary. And there are so many reasons she should be removed from office um, because she asked someone about her driving speed awareness course probably isn't the major one on my list. Do you think there's, a, to a certain extent, uh, the reason of keeping her in is to keep Brexiteers within the Conservative Party happy? It's definitely to keep the hard right on board. I mean, we saw this this Nat C conference definitely build for exactly that particular dog whistle purpose. And I think Sunak is so weak, weak, weak as a leader. He just can't afford to lose that wing of his party. Um, he, he still has this desperate fantasy that he's going to come back elected for a majority government. And what I would say is if he can't govern with a majority of 80, he's not going to govern uh, even if he gets a majority of two after the next election. And Brendan, as a former Conservative member, what are, what are your thoughts on Rishi Sunak? What are, what are your thoughts on Suella Bromberman being kept in? Is it, is it all down to Brexit or is it down to party politics? Well, it's partly for Brexit to um, reassure the the ERG and people like that that um, that Sunak is still with them. But I, I think it's also partly in order to present himself as being, uh, as it were, less extreme. Um, there are the analysis runs people within the Conservative Party who are extreme. There's Truss and there's um, Rees Mogg and there's Bradman. But he, Sunak, is different to her. Now, there's a logical flaw there, because if he was so different to her, he would have got rid of her quite a long time ago. But nevertheless, I, I think he does like the idea um, that he can reassure the, the moderates, if such people still exist, and there are a few within the parliamentary party, I think, rather than within the membership. Within the parliamentary party, there are people um, who respond to private briefing from Sunak and his friends. Uh, well, you see, I'm not like Braverman at all. She's the unacceptable face of conservatism, but I'm the acceptable face. Uh, I think it, it is partly weakness, but I think also there's a strategy being pursued here. I feel there's a strategy there, Brendan. Are you going to secretly come out and go back into the Tory party and run for leadership? Uh, <laughs> I, I, not, don't hold your breath. Uh, um, <laughs> the Conservative Party would be something very different if people like me could rejoin it. Um, and I, I suspect it, it, it can only um, uh, avoid doing terminal damage to the country, actually, um, if it splits. Uh, I think it's quite important that the Conservative Party, the presently constituted Conservative Party, should lose the next election. But then after it, I think it's important that it splits in the national interest. Adrian, what are your thoughts? I mean, obviously, based in Portugal, what are your what are your thoughts? I mean, what are you hearing over there? Well, I mean, you know, we we get to hear uh, little bits now, now and then, but you know, it's it's not the kind of issue that dominates things from day to day obviously in in the in the way that it, it dominates things in the UK there is a general feeling of you know collapse that things are crumbling wow. um, I mean I I had uh, just yesterday finally my um, uh, residency card delivered here um, wonder, wonderfully for me as an Orthodox Christian it was on Ascension Day so Rising up, 
Yeah, yeah, Parent indeed. Um, <laughs> and had a, a good political chat with the with the post. He, he said that you know it's it's all kind of collapsing, isn't it? You know. Yeah, that and, was his perspective from having. I assume he's Portuguese. He's really yeah, yeah, following yeah. it to some extent within Europe. Kind of um, uh, Portugal, um, do, you know, may have its problems. But at least it knows where its boundaries are. Okay, there's a small dispute over Olivenza with Spain. It's been going on since 1815, but you know it's not the lead to war. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were supposed to give it back to Spain at, at, at the Treaty of Vienna. I haven't done it yet, <laughs> um, and this is of relevance because they also promised that you know, Brits could get dual citizenship with Spain and so on. Uh, you know, when they entered in 1986, they haven't done it yet. Uh, so I, d I think, you know, there's the, it's a kind of a someday, one day, never uh, approach to life sometimes, <laughs> which is a genuine problem, especially for the Brits in, in Spain, because they have, they have to give up their British citizenship if they become Spanish citizenship and that's the case in a number of different countries the Netherlands is another one for example you know Lithuania is yet another um, and so these are real real problems that people face now because they want to be both British and and European and can't have it always both ways well yeah I mean that's that's one of the reasons to do that I'm also a, it happens a citizen of Canada as well but uh um, and there's quite a lot of people who are of a, a very kind of multicultural background and for whom the, with what's going on in the UK means that we feel that we would be targets and already have been targets because we're, we ain't pure uh, English. Make a point uh, about the difficulties of, of people with double nationality or not having double nationality. Um, uh, whatever the failings of either the British or national governments, it was inevitable that when you had a, a perfectly stable and straightforward situation of the United Kingdom being within the, the European Union, and you suddenly throw a vast boulder into that pond, uh, of course individuals are going to suffer from it, even if there's goodwill on the part of, of all the officials involved, which there may or may not be. It's such an enormous upheaval uh, that it's inconceivable um, that there shouldn't be a, a fallout and, and, and personal victims and unfairness uh, arising from Brexit for citizens who are in an unusual position. Nothing wrong with being in an unusual position, being a double citizen, but it's not, it's not the, the statistical norm. And precisely such people are, are going to be the, the obvious victims of Brexit. I want to come in on that point. You, you, I know what you're saying about it not being statistically the norm, but this was the promise that was made to people by us being in the EU, that they could live their lives without worry about this. This, this is how people in the late 70s, the 80s, the 90s, this was the promise on which they base their entire lives. So the, the, the issues that they're facing now are uh, the result of a complete moral failure on behalf of, well, let, 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 let's be, uh, on behalf of all of us to actually manage where we are at the moment. And obviously I would say the easiest way is to rejoin the EU. Uh, and I can't really think of any other solution uh, that will uh, solve some of those uh, ethical dilemmas that uh, we have there, but there needs to be action. And it's not morally conscionable to leave people in the positions that we've said that. Indeed, um, for those watching, We've just had a meeting with some of uh, our supporters across Europe uh, before this meeting, and we hear these sort of stories time and time again. Uh, a very uh, nice lady from Spain joined us today talking about exactly the problems that she was having as a result of the promises made to her. So this is not this is not uh, a minority issue. It's something that's hugely important to hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, it is hugely important. I didn't mean to, to minimise that, but I just wanted to say that Inevitably, there are large numbers of different cases which present themselves, all of which were easily solved by being within the European Union. And when we leave the European Union, then these different cases have to be solved in a different way. It seemed to resolve issues of immigration, because I think I think Labour came out in question time the other night and said, 
oh, when we were in charge, we were in the EU, immigration was at 25,000 or 50,000. It's now 600. When it was like, are you trying to say it was better when we were in the EU? Are you trying to say it was better when Labour were in? But we also have Northern Ireland. It solved the problem. There were no borders on either side. So everyone seemed to be happy. I'd say to a certain extent, certain members weren't happy. They felt that everything was being eroded and they therefore, such as members, certain members, not all, certain members of the DUP pushed for Brexit, financed Brexit um, through through campaigning. So it's interesting. It's, and not, Scotland wasn't necessarily an issue whilst we're in the EU. They voted to stay. Now they're looking to leave. And we can see that gaining momentum week by week. And, I mean, there's another thing to this. It looks like it might have actually cost the Tory party, the Conservative party, its actual place as a party. Uh, it looks like it's crumbling from the inside. I mean, we've had arguments with Richard about this before. I'm going to bring in Adrian. I've had discussions with Richard before about this, who said Boris Johnson wouldn't be in power if it wasn't for Brexit or the likelihood it would be less likely for him to be in power. Adrian, what are, what are your thoughts on, on Boris Johnson and, and rejoining or being in the EU? Does that actually resolve a lot of issues that Britain has been facing over the last 50, 100 years? It doesn't resolve all of them, but it does res resolve an, an awful lot of them. And the other thing is that uh, once you're back in the EU, um, every time there's a treaty change, there's an opportunity to... Uh, negotiate some changes as part of the the change to the to the uh, to, to the treaty a part of the, the process that it's going through. So, for example, um, uh, Denmark negotiated to restrict um, uh, foreign home ownership as part of its uh, ratification of the Maastricht uh, Treaty. I think it was. It may, it may have been another one of them, but they they did that. Ireland um, asserted its rights to control its own policy over social policies and abortion and things like that. And so th that is the way in which to do things. It is not um, just to walk out and then you lose all your bargaining ability by leaving. Uh, the only thing you've got left if you leave is, is making some financial contributions. But, you know, that's no good there's a danger of not rejoining, of things getting worse and worse and worse. And that is why the British electorate is, is now, uh, latest figures I've seen, it's like, uh, I think, 63% to 37% um, in favour of rejoining, or at least regretting leaving, which is not quite the same thing, but it's heading that it direction. Is different. It, 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 it is different. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that 63% of people want to rejoin in the sense that they would be prepared to um, go through the political process of rejoining. Yeah. Um, and I think I'd add something to what Adrian just said, that, of course, being in the EU wouldn't solve all, all the United Kingdom's pro problem, but the process of rejoining the European Union, I think, would be a very salutary one for the United Kingdom, because I think it would have to realise um, that uh, it's not just made a mistake, but it's made a mistake for, for rather uh, silly reasons. Uh, the idea that somehow we were less dependent on the European Union than they were on us. We held all the cards. We could have our cake and eat it. I, I think those were, were damaging national myths. And they were to do with the psychological problems of the United Kingdom. Uh, and to be back in the European Union will involve not humiliation or anything like that, but a much greater realism about the United Kingdom's place in the world. And I think that, that will be a salutary outcome. Uh, one of the things I do find ironic is the idea that we would have terrible uh, terms imposed upon us. If it means joining the euro and joining Schengen and being fully participant in all the activities of the European Union, then I think that's a benefit to the country rather than something which is inflicted upon us. Well, it's interesting with Ireland. They're not part of Schengen. And I think we'd be able to negotiate that. I think there's, there's leverage to be had. We could easily be looked at as some form of an asset. Um, like It would also, uh, not vilify, it would also acknowledge that actually the EU is correct to have us to come on board. I'm going to I'll bring in two seconds, Adrian. I'm just going to bring this in. 
the there was a car, a Jaguar, Land Rover, meant to be coming back into the UK. And it was really interesting. You just said, we hold all the cards. People will be knocking on our doors, was what we were told. And yet it's now turned out that this like uh, Jaguar Land Rover deal that's being debased on with Spain at the moment or competed with, with Spain, it's turning out that the government have admitted this week that they're having to spend somewhere between 100 and uh, 500 million to lure them over. But I was thinking, but isn't Brexit us holding all the cards? Surely they should be knocking on our door going, oh, we really want to work with you. It'd be brilliant. That's what everyone said Brexit was going to be about. There was going to be this massive opportunity. I, I did hear a good analogy about that, but I'll bring that in later. Adrian, what do you want to what do you want to say? Um, yes, I think rejoining would be uh, create a mood akin to the restoration of, of, of Charles II. It'd be as big as that. Um, because uh, you'd had the kind of lunacy of of Cromwell and and the the civil civil war, you know, uh, and and all that, uh, and you know, this is this is the kind of homeny of uh, British politics, uh, and uh, just every bit as fanatical as Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, you don't think we're going to be digging up graves and putting heads on spikes, do you? No, no. Uh, but it, it, but I, I, it's, it's the joy uh, that, mm. that, will be, that will be there. That there's this overwhelming joy of the of the restoration, and you know, people having fun again. You know, uh, celebrate Christmas again, and 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 all that. So you know, uh, and that. Um, I think very much locked um, England into the kind of European system a, 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 again, you know. Uh, and he had this, you know, uh, Portuguese wife, Catherine of Braganza, who apparently, uh, so the Portuguese claim, introduced tea drinking to the English. But, uh, yeah. Of the way in which uh, all British governmental policy has to be geared around pretending that Brexit is working. Uh, enormous sums of money have to be lavished, um, not because it's in the national interest or there's a coherent industrial policy being followed. It's just to provide a couple of headlines in the Daily Telegraph saying, whoopee, Brexit is a success. Uh, and that, that's uh, uh, one of the, the distortions that Brexit has introduced into British politics. Nothing relating to Brexit can be discussed rationally. It's all got to be discussed in terms of, of the PR of the Conservative Party. It's funny that the, the four big problems that were rabbited on by Brexiteers, well, actually, sorry, three, there is a fourth problem they didn't bring up, which is housing, the NHS and the schools. And arguably, immigration isn't the problem to that. It's the solution to that, as well as bringing in people from the UK and stepping it up and increasing the ability of everyone to get into any position, social mobility as such, which has been restricted for the last 13 years and damaged as a result of the 2008 crash. Both of these things, it's, it's, the, there's a lot of similarity to a lot of stuff that was said in the 1920s in Germany. When you talk about blaming for the loss of World War I, there was a thing about being stabbed in the back. And it feels very much like the Brexiteers are heading in that direction. They, they, they made these promises of victory. And when victory was achieved, it was shown that actually the people that were telling you this is a bad idea were actually correct. But no, no, no. I mean, Nelson Farage was on TV saying that. And you're, you made a great point, Brendan, about that uh, Jaguar Land Rover. We're trying to lure them over through bribery, not through just being great and being British. Richard, I can see you're you're nodding quite a bit to this. What are your what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, and it, in in a way, I feel a bit sad because Brenda's absolutely right about what what we're seeing to justify the Conservative Party. It's the same old rhetoric that we had seven years ago, and I must say, it's starting to strike me more and more that that belief in Brexit is a bit like belief in Santa Claus, isn't it? It might be charming and naive at one stage, but seven years later, you kind of hope that people would start to realise that something's not quite adding up. And this constant narrative we're seeing, oh, win for Brexit here, win for Brexit there. I think we really do need a little bit of common sense and realisation. I just don't know where we're going to see it come from, uh, to be frank. I don't know what you're talking about with Santa Claus. Um, Adrian. 
<laughs> well, yes, I think it's actually worse than that because uh, St. Nicholas of Myra actually did exist and his relatives <laughs> then exist to this day. And uh, he uh, notably bailed out some distressed local uh, ladies whom her father wanted to, to um, sell into prostitution by giving them enough money so that they didn't have to. That's, that's the origin of, of the generosity of St. Nicholas's Day and of Christmas. Um, so that is, uh, has much more basis, than, in fact, than, than, does, uh, um, than, than does the Brexiteers' fantasies. Um, uh, and um, so anyway, I, on that note, uh, I think we should remember what Abraham Lincoln said. You can fool all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but can never fool all the people all the time. And what's happening now is that fewer and fewer people are becoming fooled. Okay, some of us were never fooled in, in you know, by the kind of Brexit promises, but we, we thought, okay, there are one or two problems with the EU bits of reforms, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. But on balance, it was a, it's always been a much better thing. Um, well, I, I'm rather hesitant about that rhetoric. It's a historical point, but I think it's worth making that a problem for the pro-European, pro-EU campaign in, in, at the time of the referendum was that even the pro-Europeans had spent a great deal of time in the previous 50 years saying, well, on balance, the European Union's all right, but it's got to be reformed and it's got to be changed in this way and it's got to become more intergovernmental. Uh, uh, subconsciously, this oozed through to the electorate that they 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 were mm. confronted with the the UKIP people and the, the ERG, the nascent ERG people, who were in no doubt about what they thought about the European Union. It was an instrument of the devil. It wasn't Santa Claus at all. It was an instrument of the devil. And then that was contrasted with the people who said, oh, well, on balance, and if you look at the trade flows and if you look at the GDP, um, no, that, that turned out in the raw conflict of the referendum not to be good enough. And so, so I, th I think, uh, of course, it, it, no, no human organization is perfect. But I, I think one should avoid the rhetoric of saying um, the EU's got problems unless one is talking about something very specific and, and one has yeah. a, a, a clear and acceptable answer to it. I mean, well, for instance, I agree that the European Union needs to be more democratic. But my answer to that is more power for the European Parliament, more power in some ways for the European Commission, whereas that would be the precise opposite of what many people mean in this country when they say um, the European Union is undemocratic. Then you get that in general with Brexiteers. They contradict themselves. Like I was watching an interview on GB News this morning. Uh, that yeah, was... Masochism. Yeah, I know, shock. Masochism. I... <laughs> Go and lie down. Go and see a psychiatrist about it. News this morning, Alex. <laughs> so oh, you've got to learn both sides of the argument, otherwise, where are you going to get your ammunition from? <laughs> they literally supply. They are literally like the Americans supplying the Viet Cong. I probably have to edit that out. And then giving us the ammunition. On the one hand, a Brexiteer was saying, "Oh, uh, no one wants the English. Don't want to go in the fields because and do the work because you know it's." It's too hard, or they're not interested. And then, and then within a couple of minutes, and so she was complaining that food was being left in the field. And then she flipped the argument within about thirty seconds and started complaining about how foreign people were taking the jobs in the farmers' fields. And you're like, you're being inter the, the interviewer just completely went over the top of them. They obviously they weren't interested in the truth or pointing out the the contrast or contradiction there. There's literally a clip of uh, Femi ripping apart Nigel Farage in an argument who says Nigel Farage was saying that immigration can only be solved by being outside the EU because there are, there are no restrictions. Now we can see the, the fruits of that truth. But on top of that, Femi had to point out to him on air that actually there was, which he admitted to. But then he said, I never said that immigration was unlimited. And you're like, right, so you're just a, you're just a liar. And he's still allowed on TV, unlike us. Unfortunately, that's 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 the end of today. We're done for our half hour snippet. Thank reason you so much. Reason can't prevail where reason can't penetrate. I think that's the final conclusion. <laughs> final knows one. that from Thank watching GB News too much, I think. Thank you, Alex. Lovely to be right. on. Good night. Bye bye. This is a story that has been ignored by the media, and we need change. Embark on a majestic journey with the Rejoin EU party and support our cause on Patreon. Be part of the movement.
Vote to rejoin EU. Join the EU vision.